Uh, welcome. We're really glad that you're here. Uh, Liz, uh, Pilar Little, and I from uh, Oklahoma University have been working on this. We, we kind of put our heads together and said, wouldn't it be great? We have all these amazing companies involved in the tech forum, and we have students and faculty and staff at universities um, who all want to know what these companies are doing in terms of hiring. Um, so we really appreciate Woody being with us from General Atomics and Dawn from Two True Weather Solutions and Crately from Vigilant Aerospace Systems. And we really want this to be a conversation. So I asked the companies uh, present to do a little bit of background, kind of what are they doing in terms of early career um, hiring? Do they have internships or co-ops? And what are they looking for? And then um, on the flip side, we want to know what um, all, all of these amazing students are up to. Uh, what are you guys doing, Gus and Bill and Tony and uh, Francesca and whoever else is here um, that I can't see? Please turn your camera on and join the discussion. So I think that maybe we'll kick it off. Um, just I'm going to go in the order that uh, folks popped on and Woody joined us first. Uh, Woody, if you want to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about General Atomics. Okay, uh, can I share a screen real quick? You can do whatever you want. Okay, let me see if I can make this work. It says one participant. Hi, Reagan. Um, okay. Hi. Okay, uh, can everyone see our poster for the tech yeah. forum? Mm -hmm. I can. Okay, good deal. So General Atomics, our, our theme along with the theme for the UIS Tech Forum, uh, we're bringing the future faster. I'm uh, Alan Woodward Snyder. My nickname is Woody. It's not a call sign. Uh, it's a mother given nickname. So you can call me Woody. It's been my name all my life. Um, now, what's that? So General Atomics, I've had the very good fortune to work for General Atomics since January 2007 when I retired uh, from the US Navy. I was a naval aviator. And uh, it's been a place of perpetual learning. So I know that uh, Liz and Sally set this up for students. And the advantage of working with General Atomics or uh, in General Atomics is that it really is a place of perpetual learning. I have uh, been challenged and rewarded since I started with the company. I've uh, done Lynx multi-mode radar training, been a part of teams that did that maintenance training for the Air Force and the Air National Guard on our systems, uh, international partner training on our systems, and uh, worked to uh, help integrate payloads and uh, generally demystify remotely piloted aircraft. Done a lot of maintenance training as well as uh, pilot and sensor operator training. It's just been really rewarding. Even not many people know this, but the US Navy, um, a combat experiment squadron at a Point Magoo flew our MQ-9 out of the Seychelles for a number of years. And uh, that's our website down in the lower left corner of this advertisement. It's www.ga-asi.com. And uh, the Public internet presence was just updated over the Labor Day holiday, and there is a real focus on what you see here, the MQ-9B Sky Guardian and the maritime variant, the Sea Guardian, as well as the other uh, control systems, the certifiable ground control station, and uh, our other payloads and capabilities. So uh, I think that's probably enough of an introduction and we'll get on to the next person and then on to questions. I'll stop sharing my screen at this point. Thank you. Um, Cliff, welcome. Did you have anything you wanted to share? Hi, Sally. Um, no, other than I guess uh, I'm a little bit newer than Woody is at General Atomics. I've been there three years. Um, I worked at uh, Grand Whitney in military engine business for 27 years uh, before that, so I'm a jet engine guy, relatively new to RPAs as we call them, UASs. Um, it's a great company. 
Uh, it's not a small company. It's a medium sized to large company, but privately owned, um, which enables the company really to invest uh, in product development much more significantly than um, public companies. And so it's really nice where earlier in, uh, in the panel that I was on, I referred to us as the uh, build it and they will come company. And it's really kind of refreshing to be able to uh, invest that much in product development <clears throat> and the formula has worked um the company's grown almost 20 percent year over year for 20 plus years and uh and delivers an incredible products that do really amazing work both in the uh, military uh space as well as in the uh increasingly in the uh, civil space as well so thanks sally i know i wasn't i didn't think i was supposed to speak here but appreciate the few seconds thank you Oh, well, we, this is just a discussion, so. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, Don, I think uh, you joined next. Hi, hi, hi everyone. I'm Don Birchoff. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of Two Other Solutions. We're a micro weather data and analytics company that's focused on translating all this complex weather data into simple insights for decision makers, uh, especially those that are in weather sensitive businesses. Probably most of you won't, don't know, but weather uh, causes the U.S. economy $640 billion a year. And this is just due to uh, loss of production, uh, delays in moving cargo, logistics. This is not knocking buildings down. Uh, this is just productivity. And 40% of that's recoverable. So um, that's what True Weather is working on. Um, mostly the reason we're not recovering that today is one is that uh, most folks are not using the right data at the right time for the right decisions. They're using general data, general weather information. They don't realize there's a lot better data and a lot better capabilities out there, especially that some stuff that's trapped in our universities, like the University of Oklahoma or Oklahoma State, um, which, you know, those are two universities that I've worked with a lot in the, in the past uh, because of uh, the fact that I was a science and technology director at the Weather Service for four years. So I actually know everything they do, how they do it, and it frustrates the hell out of me that we're not getting it out to operations faster because it's costing us, the economy and businesses money. So the other reason that it's not, that we're not, we're dropping out on the floor is because end users don't know how to use the data really in workflows. It's done very haphazardly without any process. Um, there's a lot of decisions and workflows within a process that we could really nail it down a lot better, be more proactive in how we use weather and information. And um, we proved it in the Air Force. So I'm an Air Force vet. Um, I, uh, 24 years, I actually ran an Air Force base in Central Asia. I was the logistics, uh, it was the main staging base in and out of Afghanistan. I had 1500 people. And yes, they let a meteorologist run an Air Force base. And that's, that's what I am, I'm a meteorologist. Imagine that. It's amazing what the Air Force, you know, how crazy they are, right? Uh, but I learned so much in that year and, um, you know, running the base, the weather was tough at Manas. It was in Central Asia and Kyrgyzstan. Um, and because I was a weather guy and because we were anticipating the onset of winter and because most people don't take that seriously on a base unless the weather guy runs the base, we had all the equipment ready to go in the first storm, which was a surprise storm, but not for me. So... We had, we had all the, we had a, a, an event where we had 12 inches of snow in five, hour, five hours. And we got all the KC 135s downrange out of the airfield on time. And that was because we were prepared. And that was important because those KC 135s, they were gonna refuel A-10s that are flying over the battle space to protect people on the ground and bring air cover. So if those KC 10s aren't in the air, those A-10s have to land. Those A-10s have to land. Those people on the ground are vulnerable. So I just together here have told you how important weather is and make sure you, all you young people don't forget that. And there's a lot you could do with it. There's a lot you could do with it, but you got to be willing to do it. And uh, that's what True Weather is about. We're going to make it simple, easy, and we're going to help the UAS drone industry overcome some of the, the uncertainty that weather causes that causes them not to fly as often as they can when they can fly or causes them to take more risk when they don't need to, uh, and to get more uh, airframe utilization 
increase ROI and, and those things. So that's what we do. And uh, thank you for asking me to come out tonight. I'm about ready to have my drink, so. <laughs> it is happy hour. <laughs> Thanks, John. Sure. Greatly, do you wanna talk a little bit about Vigilant? And then also maybe some of the positions that um, your company's starting to look for. Sure, yeah, thank you, Sally and Liz, uh, for inviting us. Um, I'll give you a real quick introduction, and I also have a slide I can share um, when you want me to. I'll put it up, and then we can decide if you want to share it. But um, so very happy to introduce the company. We're, we're kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum. So we are an early stage tech startup. Um, if you are interested in working for and with an early stage tech startup that is headquartered in Oklahoma City, um, then, then we are the company for you. And uh, we love that. We love that as our story for recruits because, um, you know, it's great to be doing this type of technology and, and really innovative work um, at a place uh, that, that people don't always first think of Oklahoma and Oklahoma City as a place that you're going to find an early stage tech startup. So we, we just love that. And people that work with us, that's what they get from it. They get to do this in Oklahoma. Um, I will say we have people working all across the U.S. actually. Our, our workforce is very distributed, especially right now. Um, we do have people that work for us who have um, done internships uh, in a couple of cases, three cases actually with NASA. Um, and had an opportunity because our technology, I'll talk about real briefly, emerges from a couple of NASA patents that we licensed and is actually actively used at NASA in their um, flight testing, especially, especially on their supersonic aircraft and eventually spacecraft. Um, we are in a position to recruit out of NASA and that's been, been fun. Um, and so we do have some, some graduate students uh, that, that have worked and do work with us. Um, I will tell you right now, we have um, in this, this um, meeting, there are three job descriptions. And I also posted in the chat a link to our job page. Um, we are, those jobs, I, I will warn you, are mostly full and they're very specific, um, but we um, will likely be recruiting again exactly around these types of positions. Um, and so we encourage you to take a look at those. Um, our company develops safety software for unmanned aircraft. It's also used in special cases with manned aircraft. It's used by NASA. Um, and it is based on a couple of patents. It was developed at NASA Armstrong. Um, we, get to, we get to play with drones a lot. We get to play with actually uh, portable radars. So we own our own radar that we carry around with us in the car. And then we can pull it out and put it on a tripod and track all the aircraft and sometimes the birds and cows as we find in Oklahoma. Um, it's kind of whatever we see that day. We're actually writing filters so you don't see all the birds and cows. Um, so there's all kinds of fun stuff. We, uh, we work a lot with um, standards and technologies that are coming out of the FAA in terms of, of new rules. So we have to know that side of things. Um, but we do get to work with a lot of really interesting cutting edge technologies. Uh, the, you know, the radars really are cool. We're not a radar company, we're a software company, but we get to integrate with all this hardware from the drone to the radar to the radio receivers. Um, and so, so that, that's really what we get to do. And, and that's the, the part of our job that is the most fun. Um, Sally, do you, I have a slide that just goes over like some of the skills and things that we're seeing emerge. Yeah, it would be, about that be now? easiest, I think, if you just shared your screen, you should have that capability. Okay, I'll share this real quick and we can just, uh, I'll just run through this real quick. I think it's going to start from the beginning here. These are my slides from my prior presentation earlier. Here we go. So early career opportunities. So this is what we're seeing. And I just put this together. Um, when we think of, of people in an early career stage entering the industry, you know, we, the attraction that we see is that it is very much a growing industry. It's growing quickly. Um, in particular states, it's, it's growing rapidly. Oklahoma, obviously, and Kansas are two of those states. Um, we also do a lot of work in North Dakota. Um, and uh, so there are places where this industry is growing. It's really a hungry industry. It's looking for talent. It's looking for people who have an interest. Um, and most of the technology right now is based on recent innovations. Um, and what that means is that, particularly when we talk to computer scientists and aerospace engineers and others, a lot of the things that are going on with unmanned aircraft right now 
are around the, the latest technologies that you will have been exposed to or recently learned. Um, and so that, that's been great for us. Um, so the things that we look for in particular and in general that we see, you know, unmanned aircraft are flying robots. They are the internet of things in the air. And, and so that really pulls a lot of interesting things together. So obviously software development, hardware development, aerospace engineering, but it's inherently an IoT problem. These devices are increasingly connected. So we're focused in the commercial market with a little bit of exposure to the military market, but increasingly everything has to be connected to function. It's gotta be directed, it's gotta be logistically sent where it's gotta go, it's gotta be flying there safely, and so you really have to be connected to do all that. Um, human, um, machine interface is really important for a lot of these things. RF technologies are important. Sensing technologies are incredibly important. Um, machine learning and AI is something that the industry is needing a lot more of. And then cybersecurity, just massive need and importance for that right now. As all these devices that are flying around overhead are all gonna be connected, that cybersecurity component becomes incredibly important. So this is what we're seeing in the industry. I just have this one slide and I just wanted to share that. This is uh, us playing with a few of our toys um, out actually at Oklahoma State University uh, with some of their drones, which we were monitoring and tracking and doing our detect and avoid work um, on those drones. Thanks, Kaylee. <clears throat> If you guys are in the meeting, um, I know we're on the Zoom right in uh, on a Zoom meeting right now. But um, in the agenda, you'll see next to this particular meeting where it says "Chat Polls People Files," we have uploaded um, all kinds of files from Vigilant and from uh, General Atomics. And Don, if you have anything you want us to upload, we're happy to do that as well. So. Um, I, I'm not going backwards. Don, um, do you want to talk about some of the hiring you've been doing, internships, um, specifically, you know, what, what's happening with True Weather? Sure. Well, we, uh, we have a very uh, uh, robust intern program. My center, we, you know, our main center is up in Syracuse, so, but it doesn't mean people can't work virtually. Um, we, have, we have used a co-op program at Syracuse University very effectively. Right now we have, I, I guess, you know, we, um, we started in New York in January 2018. And we probably have hired literally 20 to 25 interns in that time frame. And right, right now we have five um, paid interns and four unpaid and people are coming to us to work for free. I, I mean, I don't like doing that, but you know, I just can't afford, you know, I'm a small business, right? And um, I just can't afford to pay everybody, but people begging me literally saying, we really want to get that expertise with your company, what you're doing, you know, the analytics we're building, the data fusion, the data science, the techniques we're using to build out our stack. Um, they want that experience. So, um, you know, we, we give them an opportunity to work with us. And um, it's been amazing what interns can do for you if you, if you give them a, a plan, they see how they fit in the big picture, and you, you know, you, you really work with them, it's well worth the effort. Um, we've gotten, some of our interns have been with us since the beginning, and they're graduating. We've even had several that have graduated that are, and these are software engineers, by the way. I just want you to know, these are all computer science engineering software, master's degree students out of SU that um, have built our back end, basically, under my leadership. And we have a very strong uh, data manager and, um, and we have some other folks, but, um, you know, I, I swear by it because, um, you get them motivated and they love it. So yeah, so we have a, a lot of those opportunities and um, we, you know, we, we are looking for meteorologists, but we're also looking for software engineers, cloud, you know, cloud is big now. We, you know, we, we haven't yet started hiring any um, data scientists outside of weather, but I know that day is coming, machine learning. Um, and I think, you know, what I always tell the, the weather group and I don't know, I have to ask the question, is anybody a weather meteorology major in this group? Anyone? So I know if there is one. Oh. Yeah. 
<laughs> Francesca, how you doing? Good, how are you? I'm good. So, um, so now I feel like at least I'm talking to somebody that understands me. Um, we, you know, where uh, we, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of software work that we have to do in order to make things work, just like uh, you know, Vigilant would, because you know we're all manipulating data, right? It, and now, weather data is the first big data that's ever. I mean, it really was the original big data. In fact. We were, you know, when you people started calling big data something, I was laughing, you know, because we we did big data before big data was a, a term. But um, so weather data is very complex and it is very challenging. That's why I think people kind of like like to work with us because they really learn how to do use a data set that's very a lot of variety, uh, you know, diversity, data types, sensor types. None of the data comes off these systems in the same formats. None of it comes out at the same time. None of it. You know, it, it's, it has to be all fused, it has to be all weighted, it has to be all, you know, uh, uh, nudged, uh, you know, and whether it is all smoke and mirrors, you guys, I, a lot of you I know believe that, and uh, it really is, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors in weather, no, but seriously, it's, um, yeah, we, we're, we're doing a lot and, and encourage people that are interested in a challenge to, to consider the field. Thank you. I have to ask Francesca one question, right? Because she's here. And so what year are you in? I am a second year master's student. Ah, good for you. So are you going to um, get your PhD or are you going to graduate? I am working on my master's and then figuring it out. <laughs> so what do you, what's your thesis? So as a, it's been kind of a evolution. I have worked with uh, convective initiation data and it's kind of transitioned into using low-level buoyancy as a metric for um, atmospheric boundary layer transitions before convective um, cases, stable cases. I have one low-level jet case so kind of teasing things out at the moment. Um, I, I don't know why you, just, why you care about severe weather. I mean I don't get it. It, it's fun to look at. <laughs> no, I, I'm teasing. I, cause I thought everybody would appreciate that in Oklahoma. Yeah. Um, it's but, Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah. But, um, who's your, um, who's your, uh, your advisor? Uh, Philip Jolson. Ah, yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, um, you know, meteorology majors today, they, one of the things they they've got to understand is that the future is in, is in understanding all the big data techniques now that are being leveraged for AI and machine learning. It's, it's totally different. Like you could be a scientist, but then you also got to become, a, uh, you know, well aware of all those tools. And then you've also got to uh, really understand the operators, right? Cause everything has to be impacts based. You know, we have operators in here from general atomics and, and the vigilant and, um, you know, they don't want to really hear us tell them there's a 30% chance that you might get a shower, right? You want to, they want to know, is it going to rain or not, right? Has anybody uh, ever had that problem uh, out there? So, um, but no, yeah. And, I, and, and by the way, the joke that you guys are only right 50% of the time you get paid, I, I, I know that one already. So, but um, you got to have thick skin, <laughs> right? So anyway, nice meeting you, Francesca. Thanks, Francesca. Thank you. Woody, you want to go over a little bit in more specifics, kind of your internship, co-op, uh, uh, early hiring kinds of opportunities that are happening? So uh, Cliff Stone can also speak to this because he had a little more contact with uh, the interns for 2020 that worked in uh, sustainment. But I will say that uh, I did, we had so many interns at General Atomics that uh, there were 280 to 300 throughout the constellation of companies in 2020. And I had to do uh, two separate sessions of uh, Cisco WebEx in order to present the company history and overview to all the interns. Um, so that was, uh, it's been a good year uh, and we, uh, didn't shut down our intern program because of COVID. The company uh, was very 
uh, progressive and thoughtful and had interns working from uh, home or hotel rooms um, and then had them flex to uh, work sites safely based on uh, all the guidance that the, the company took in. And if you go into work, you better have a mask or you're going to get turned away. So it's, uh, it's been great uh, at General Atomics. Uh, right now, there's only a couple of intern positions that are open at ga-careers.com. Uh, but we'll see how things work out for 2021 and the number of interns. Uh, for 2019, we had about 280 to 300. For 2020, we had 280 to 300. And hopefully 2021 will work out that way too. But it's in the planning stages right now. That's great. Cliff, did you have something you wanted to share? Yeah, two things really. Um, and let's talk about after internships and <clears throat> real life and a job. So one of the neat things about working for a bigger company is almost any background um, fits. And so our products are highly engineered. So obviously we need engineers. Um, mechanical engineers, aerospace engineers, electrical manufacturing, uh, engineering is important. Um, but also Woody and I are in a department that uh, both operates and maintains uh, products. So uh, pilots and sensor operators and avionics technicians um, and A&P mechanics, um, logisticians, um, uh, so we need those um, as well as all the other functional uh, sorts of um, jobs, whether it be a program manager, a finance manager, um, contracts, you know, accounting. So the, uh, the opportunities are really endless. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do is I wanted to talk to Don. So uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm an airplane nerd like, like many of us, and I uh, often find myself... Um, Lately, virtually, but I like it a lot better in person where we raise our voice and our blood pressure goes up and we get excited because we're talking about airplanes. And it's so cool, Don, to uh, hear you have that same kind of passion uh, for a completely different uh, career field. And so I'm enjoying listening to you be passionate about meteorology and weather and big data, which I thought was a new thing. I didn't know it was an old thing. Well, <laughs> Well, Cliff, let me tell you, first off, we should be passionate together, right? Because, you know, weather and piloting go together, right? And, and there's a lot of work. There's really a lot of good things we could be doing together and, and really helping. Um, it's just amazing how much data is out there that we falls on the floor today, right? And, and we need to be scarfing that stuff up and turning it back around to you guys, right? So, you, you know, you don't have those surprises. Um, but you know, I wanted to be a weather person when I was seven years old. That's how, I mean, I don't know if Francesca has a story like this or not, but generally meteorologists, we're crazy. I mean, like 80% of us know at seven or eight years old, that's what we're going to do. And, uh, I don't know, part of that I think is because of this, this wonder and, you know, the fact that you can't solve the problem. I think we're all kind of crazy, you know, we're all a little nuts, right? Cause you can't solve the problem. So why would you? want to do something you can't solve right but um i appreciate you recognizing that and again i would love to you know work with anybody who wants to really learn how to use this stuff you know it's it is exciting and i'm glad you're ex excited about your piloting i i had f had f-16 pilots i was trapped with them at kunsan air base in south korea we were it was a remote tour and um when they used to come back after they had bad weather uh, I couldn't hide anywhere, so we'll leave it at that. <laughs> it's all good. Good to meet you, Don. Nice to meet you, too. <laughs> well, thanks. I'm going to turn it over to Liz. All right. So I guess I'm going to flip the script a little bit because I do see some student faces, and my, there might be some student faces on the other side of some of these cards. You can't join us on video right now, too. But I think I want to ask you guys, as well as people who might be working with students or trying to facilitate internships for their students. This can be open to any of you. But what do you think are some classes that you're taking or wish to be taking that could facilitate you entering jobs in this workforce or things that you might like to get experience and that could get you better prepared for internships or jobs in these or like shadowing opportunities or things like that that companies could offer you 
to maybe better test to see if you're interested in a career in doing weather data if you're not maybe necessarily inherently an atmospheric scientist. Because while I am an atmospheric chemist, I had no idea what I was getting into when I came to Oklahoma. So I'm even outside of my own field, for instance. But you have to get an experience with it to know that maybe this is for me. You have to tr be able to try it on, right? So I kind of want to open it up to the students to even ask their own questions a little bit about what classes might be good to help develop some of these skills if you're unsure. So I want to let the students have a little time to ask just freewheeling of their own and because you have three very different companies here you have one more in manufacturing and aerospace you have one more in weather data and applications and you have one more in UTM and software so you have three very different applications of IMAN systems so I'm going to encourage the students to go nuts <laughs> if there are any you don't want to have to be shy. <laughs> well, I could take it a little bit sideways because I would imagine that most of the students are here, at least the ones that I'm seeing here, <laughs> are graduate students. Uh, and so I would assume we're more focused on our research than classes per se. Uh, although I will make a comment that uh, through special studies, I could really hone in uh, on classes that would actually help instead of the standard for format of class because in a sense, uh, UAS is a, a frontier technology and, and you're not, unless uh, you're in a school that has a UAS program, you know, you're not gonna find those classes available. If you look at even in my case, or I'm a PhD student in electrical and computer engineering, but my program was literally a third electrical engineering, a third aerospace engineering, and a third meteorology. Uh, caveat, I do work with Liz on the Center for Autonomous <laughs> Sensing and Sampling, just so you guys know, uh, under Dr. Phil Chisholm with Francesca, uh, oh, where we- Phil? Okay. Yeah, we all, where we have a cool team of engineers and meteorologists. Uh, so that's why I'm making the sidebar here that maybe I'm, I don't want to talk about classes that much, but, um, uh, uh, one thing that I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious as a student and, um, uh, and I was a little bit concerned, I must admit, is that because UAS applications are still not, you know, a broad market as, uh, other professions. For instance, I worked, uh, before I came here to do my PhD, I worked 10 years in oil and gas. So that's a way bigger market. Um, one thing I was concerned is that I would become too specialized in my, my field. And uh, so I would like maybe to ask you guys and the companies, how do you see higher education students, you know, PhD students, master students, converting their research skills back to industry, especially in leading uh, technology industries like UAS. More, I'm gonna open it up, yeah, whoever wants to answer yeah. can feel free. Well, you know, I'll take a shot at that. Um, obviously, if you're, if you're piloting and, and, and things like that, you know, um, that's not going to be something that's easily transferable to other areas. But if you're involved in the software, in the systems, in the sensor components of it, uh, you know, then there's a whole world of other cap you know, jobs out there that use those types of capabilities, you know. And um, again, so much of it's fungible. I know that Vigilant could talk about this probably because you, you know, you you're doing it, you know, you're doing the software side and there's things you're doing that I'm doing. I'm just doing them. I'm just focusing on different problems. Um, so that's a very fungible skill. Anything with sensors, anything with sensor fusion, cleaning data, data analytics, you know, running applications from those, uh, you know, those are all very fungible skills. And, um, and so I think that from that perspective, if you're a student, 
and you and you like piloting or you like UAS, but you're able to focus on those types of skill sets to get into the industry and something doesn't work out, you definitely have options. Hey Gus, um, I'll add on to that. Gus also has a video. I don't. I'm sorry, Gus has a video. Gus, I don't know how easy it would be to play your video that talks about your um, research that you're working on. Yeah. I just saw Bill because thumbs up in big time at the bottom of the corner down there. <laughs> well, I can link to the Pathable page where it is here on the chat, but given that it's within the Pathable uh, infrastructure, I don't have much control over it, but here's the link on the chat. Okay. Uh, but go go okay, ahead. So uh, if Cliff. you guys want to see the the work that, go ahead, Cliff. Sorry. Oh, sorry, Sally. Sorry. We will never get good at this whole Zoom thing, will we? <laughs> um, hey, let's see, Gus. There you are. <laughs> You've moved on my screen. I was just going to add on to what Don said a little bit, um, and I'll reference the old days. And uh, Don, you'll know this from your from Air Force Base. So it used to be, you know, you built an airplane, you learned how to fly an airplane. Other people were flying airplanes, they didn't talk to each other. And uh, anymore, I mean, it is systems of systems. I talked a little bit earlier about swarming. And if you take a look at any uh, concept of operations, and I'm in defense and I always have been, so that's kind of my swim lane. Um, it's about all kinds of different systems working together to complete a mission. and. Uh, so it's very much about, about uh, systems engineering. I didn't even mention that kind of engineering. Um, and so, and honestly, like you mentioned, UAS is small. All of aerospace is small. So I find myself in, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter if I'm an engine guy or a UAS guy or a, a prime or a supplier. It's all the same people. And then UA, so you're right. Aerospace is small. UAS is a smaller subset of aerospace. However, um, the technologies that feed it, especially going into the future, uh, more and more come out of uh, small startup uh, companies, uh, acad academia, et cetera. So, um, so certainly, I mean, while it is a relatively small and specialized community, I think the technologies that enable it, pick your favorite, AI, machine learning. We just saw a chart from Vigilant, I think, showed us that chart. It's all the same. You know, so in, in any case, if, if you're in a STEM, you know, and I know you guys are all PhD students and masters and whatever, I mean, the, the kind of uh, learnings that you're having and the uh, research that you're doing certainly is going to be applicable both uh, in UAS, in aerospace, but more broadly just in uh, the technical world that we live in. Yeah, in a sense, I kind of took uh, Don's advice in it already when I was trying to figure this out. Uh, so my master's work was a uh, sensor payload integration directly to the flight, flight controller. So not only we could use the, the flight telemetry to enha enhance uh, meteorological data post-processing, right? Because you can back out position of the aircraft, the exact position in space, in time and space where the measurement was taken things like that. And that's actually what the video that Sally was talking about uh, refers to. That's my master's research. And now for my PhD research, I'm doing a, I'm bringing my experience with distributed systems in uh, oil and gas to UAS to try to attempt, okay, attempt <laughs> yet a distributed uh, flight controller uh, for two aircrafts uh, flying in uh, severe weather to try to measure a feature that you, Don, might appreciate uh, that appears in, uh, in models but has never been measured in nature. It's called the streamwise uh, vorticity current, and it feeds uh, supercells and, and potentially could give us a better knowledge of what generates tornadoes a little bit better and things like that. So we're trying to measure that and to do so, we do need uh, two aircraft to cooperate to mimic what we, what meteorologists love to do, which is a two point measurement in towers. And then you can back out 
uh, what is in between the measurements. So we're trying to mimic that with UAS. Uh, so in a sense- Gus, Gus, it sounded really uh, sophisticatedly professional, the vorticity thing. But uh, just for everyone else, you might want to explain that that's a, you know, a channeling of wind shear, right? Or an area of shear that's causing the spin, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. 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 It's a, essentially, it's a, a really large feature of rotating shear that it's feeding the storm, right. you know, uh, and it's powering the storm. It, well, I should say, it is assumed to be because it appears in models and things like that, but it was never measured really. So um, to make it sound a little bit more juicy, <laughs> I think you could say that this is something that was proven in simulations, but it's not has hasn't been discovered outside in the in the in the atmosphere yet. True. Yeah. So that's what we're gonna attempt to do. And and to do that, I'm gonna also attempt to have a distributed uh flight control loop between aircraft. So where they're literally cooperating in this very turbulent environment, uh, which is hard to fly and uh, to see if we can coordinate uh, the measurements. So but, this, this, is, this is the kind of stuff though, when we talked earlier, I don't know how many people sat in on our weather panel today, but we, eh, thank you, Liz. So we, um, you know, I talked a lot about the fact there's a lot of science and physics we don't understand out there that is not really in our models, right? And that's why we can't discern these things. And that's why we use machine learning sometimes to take a shortcut, right? Uh, Gus is trying to do the hard work. He's trying to figure out how do we know where this is happening and how it's happening so we can actually put it in a physical model rather than us say, hey, we had a tornado and this must have happened in this case. And so next time we have this situation, we'll forecast a tornado, right? But that doesn't mean that's the way it works, right, Gus? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But on, to be quite honest, this is so uh, novel that in the stages of the first measurements that we're going to try to make, we're really exploring what's out there instead of uh, trying to prove from the get-go. So we, we want to explore the measurements because it's technically very difficult to even fly in these conditions. So so the, the flight control, it's going to be a, a, a distributed flight control that emulate two tethered aircraft and with a 500 meter spacing between them uh, vertically, it's going to be a challenge, but hopefully it will work. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the good news is that's what's the fun about being a student. If it doesn't work, then you just write up your thesis about why it didn't work and just write it off, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but, but the, so you the are... original question is, um... okay, so I'm going to do two questions in one then. So, and then I stop talking so I don't hog the session. Uh, but the question is, okay, it didn't work. I learned a bunch and I have all these tools now on my belt. Mm -hmm. uh, and now it's time to transition to industry. So my first question would be, what do you guys recommend for this transition? And two, I'll do a question for Tony and I, because we're in the same boat. Uh, I know uh, uh, some of the industry represented here, representatives here are from highly defense side of things. Uh, how is that for foreigners? Because Tony and I are both foreigners. Yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> right? Um, not impossible, um, but obviously um, a lot of programs are U.S. only. Um, so, yeah, I know a, a kind of joking kind of answer, but it actually is a little bit of a problem. I don't really, don't really know how to quantify it. Um, there certainly are defense programs. Um, that are not ITAR, that are not classified, um, but you're but you're right. Um, many of them are U.S. you know citizen uh, only. I don't have a number. I don't know, Woody. You've been in this space, or anybody else? I don't know. I mean, it's a it's tough to quantify for me. Sure, it's quantifiable. I can't quantify it. But this is this is Woody. Um, I would say that 
within General Atomics, there are several different companies. So if you uh, don't be discouraged, get on the GA-Careers uh, website and just look around and do a keyword search. It seems simplistic, but if you look at GA Energy, it is um, since 1955, that's where all of the other General Atomics companies have actually come from. They are the smallest company because they grow this company and then they set it free inside of the constellation of General Atomics companies. But GA Energy, especially the fusion energy experimentation is uh, wide open to all nationalities um, and all that information and uh, a lot of what happens at the supercomputing center here in San Diego is open to all nationalities. So uh, that's a great place to look for an internship. In fact, I just referred um, a manufacturing uh, internship uh, to uh, the fusion energy uh, part of the company. I just sent that to uh, Kansas State Engineering uh, last month, and I, I don't think they filled it, but somebody's taken that, uh, that internship. Uh, but that is, is open to um, international persons. So uh, get out there and, and, and take a look. Uh, it's a pretty interesting place. We're, we're lucky at the Center for Autonomous Sensing and Sampling to have two of the very best in the world join us from South America. So. Bill, was that recent? Was that under recent regulations or was that? <clears throat> oh, I'm talking about Gus and Tony. Oh, okay. He's joking. <laughs> yeah. He, yeah, he's just pulling the student's legs. I don't, I don't um, have any doubt. I don't have any doubt whatsoever. Sally, can I, can I throw in a couple of two cents about some of those questions? Yeah. So I, I, one thing I, I would say to you is that the UAS industry as a whole is extremely international. It is being advanced all across the world. The um, committees that I serve on, so I serve on some ASTM committees, we are specifically writing international technical standards to help synchronize technologies, and airspace protocols and safety systems worldwide because aircraft don't really recognize borders. You have to be safe whether you're flying on this side of the border or the other side of the border and you use the same systems and preferably the same equipment and the same standards and the same way to talk to air traffic control or talk to the computer that's performing air traffic control for everybody which is what's emerging as the way it all works. So I would be I would strongly encourage you to think of the industry that way, to remember that a lot of the standards that are emerging, in another session, I was just talking about the Global UTM Association that is helping to harmonize. So I've just been to sessions in the last couple of weeks in which all of these standard setting committees, because it's in aviation, they have to harmonize everywhere all the time. What that means is that the technologies that are developed and the skills that are developed to implement those technologies are internationally relevant, particularly if you focus on what's emerging in the industry, which are some really strong international standards, because aviation has always been an international business. Um, we often compare it to the cell phone business. You don't have to go buy a tower or go do a Google search for a tower when you turn your cell phone on and try and make a call to somebody. You don't really worry very much about whether that other person's cell phone is on a different cellular network than yours is. And the reason all of that works, and you can call somebody in Buenos Aires right now and have high confidence that you will reach them is because there are international standards and there's engineering all across all these borders to make it all work. None of it works without that. And so I, I would just encourage you, particularly in the UAS industry, to understand that there are actually lots of countries that are well ahead of the US because their regulations work differently. They have less complex airspace. Um, they have far, far less traffic, and so they can be far more experimental with their unmanned aircraft. And we see this all the time in the industry. That, that I was talking earlier about the U-Space initiative in Switzerland. If you look at what's going on in the UK, if you look at what's going on um, in some parts of Asia, um, if you look at especially what's going on across Africa, 
um, with, with Zipline and uh, some of the in Matternet, some of the other co uh, companies that are doing uh, clinical deliveries over long distances with unmanned aircraft um, in several African countries. They're just doing amazing things and they're really working hard to bring all that technology here to benefit us in the US as well. But they've pioneered that stuff all over the world. Um, so anyway, that, that's, I, I just work in a very international industry, I feel, um, because there is a lot of international influence in terms of how you put standards and systems together because your aircraft don't really recognize borders. You have to fly over those borders all day long. Um, and the other thing I would say is think of UAS as sort of the leading edge of the entire robotics industry. Really, it's about robotics, and we happen to be in flying robotics, um, but it's really a flying Internet of Things. It's a flying robotics industry. We're at the cutting edge of autonomy. We're at the cutting edge of battery technologies, fuel cells. Um, you know, every form of cutting edge technology People want to implement it in UAS, and then immediately they want to implement it in robotics. So we run across people who have a lot of questions about autonomous cars. There's overlap in the sensors, particularly when you get into LiDAR technologies. So innovations in autonomous cars are pushing the UAS industry and some of the sensors we use. I have no doubt that some of the techniques and safety standards and other things that we develop will push their, ways, their way into other autonomous vehicle markets. Um, and so I think that anything you learn in a UAS company, you're going to find translates very quickly over into other markets, because it's really all about autonomy and robotics, which is driving lots of different industries right now. Um, we, I'll give you one really practical example. So we interviewed someone who had um, not, not as part of their graduate degree, just for fun, they had, had created an IoT device to attach to their home smoker in their backyard that would notify their phone when they needed to go um, um, adjust their smoker so they could keep the temperature and the smoke right to get their barbecue perfect. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was fantastic. I mean, we, we were really eager about that candidate. And he'd done this for fun, right? And he'd had to integrate three or four things. There were sensors, there was an IoT device. You know, he'd tried a couple things. He'd ended up, of course, with a Raspberry Pi. And then he had to write a mobile app, deliver all the data to his mobile app, and create alerting systems and a rule set to figure out what it was supposed to do and tell him when. And we were like, that's a pretty good hobby project there. We like that. So anyway, that's an example. <laughs> Thanks, Greatly. I can I actually else? resonate with your thoughts, um, Greatly. So, um, I was gonna give another example on, on, on kind of those lines, like um, trying to provide solutions, like um, not only to, uh, trying to get the solution out there that it's already there offering you, but also like in, try to do your own research and bring things together to provide something unique. And I think that's something that we are doing, uh, mainly Gus here, um, Bill as well at CAS. Uh, there are things that we are trying to do ourselves, unique solutions that are unique for, for, for the meteorologists in our case. Uh, such, for example, the copter sun. I, I don't know if you've seen the videos regarding the copter sun and all that. Um, so the copter sun, for example, it's something that you won't like find something unique out in the market. It's something that we brought together at pieces. Uh, we we did research on sensors, and we also made our own custom uh, frameworks and, and codings to make this work and make it suitable for the application. So, yeah, um, can I we agree see on, your video? on can what, Bill? Can we see your video? Is it? It is actually there in the same link as Gus. Amanda, sent. do you want to play the video real quick? Are you there? Yeah, I sure can. Okay, let's see if we can make it work. Uh, it's a uh, copter Sunday at USA. Tony's video. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Copter Sand. Copter Sand. Copter Sand. Like Radio Sand. If you're familiar with Radio Sand, that is deliberate. That's correct. My name is Tony Segales. I'm a PhD student in electrical engineering. 
start from the beginning. There My go. name is Tony Segales. I'm a PhD student in electrical engineering, also working for CAS at the University of Oklahoma. At CAS, we're trying to address the challenge of filling the observational gap that is present in the lower atmosphere among meteorological instruments such as towers and radio sounds. My main project is the design and development of the copter sound, an ambitious and unique drone for weather sampling. A huge amount of knowledge in CAD design, 3D printing, autopilot coding, and flight studies produce what I believe is one of the most thoughtful solutions when trying to capture weather phenomenon up to one mile high. The wind vane behavior algorithm, the modular payload design, and the user friendliness given to the copter song were all thought and combined together to provide state-of-the-art weather data. This is a very promising project that can open a lot of opportunities, not only for scientists, but also to people whose business is what they're dependent. Nice. Uh, yeah, there you have it. So it's really good. So yeah, basically, um, that's kind of like the summary of my research, trying to like create this uh, device, that this drone, specifically for the meteorology application. And I guess, well, I mean, everything that you saw there, it's something that we created. We put everything together. And I guess that for the people here that it's also interested, and might, might, might be interested on here on this, um, and you are like, uh, you know about these things, you can contact Liz if you want to join the team and maybe like uh, make, make things better. Uh, so this copter sound, we are working on code. There are, there are so many things that we're using, like for example, GitHub. We're also based on uh, open source autopilot. Uh, we are also very uh, good at 3D printing. We have these very cool 3D prints, uh, uh, printers, uh, thanks to Bill. We also design CAD. Uh, we also like are very good at flying things. So if, you're, if you just like flying things, you can also come with us and join for some really cool field campaigns out in the, in the field and collect data. And it's a pretty unique experience uh, doing all this science uh, for the meteorology, right? Thanks, Tony. That's awesome, man. I think Francesca has a video too <laughs> on the spot. <laughs> My uh, video isn't as uh, masterfully designed. <laughs> I feel a little bit cheated. <laughs> Yours is you fine. Do you want to supply it, Francesca? <laughs> if if the um, people want it. <laughs> I had a thought earlier when, when Crately was talking and he was saying, um, I forget what he, I had a thought I should have typed it in the chat, but it's gone now. <laughs> um, crap. It's about that time of day. It is about that time of day. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, it was about the tinkering, the tinkering story about the smoker. That's a very similar thing when I'm interviewing students to work in our research lab. So that type of skill sets are what I'm looking for in our undergrads because with Phil, who's down there, um, uh, I look, advise a lot of our undergrads for our team. So these are the types of skills I am looking for in undergrads or even just an interest in tinkering, right? They want to get their hands in that, even if they're a meteorology student. That's kind of what I'm looking for because that's the type of interface I'm kind of looking at. Even if, even if they are going to be doing modeling, if they're interested in measurements, they need to at least be able to understand what they're doing and the, what their models are ingesting. And on the engineering side, they need to know what their data their collecting is doing. So um, it has, a, it's a very similar thing in academia. I'm looking for that in students all the time. So that was it. <laughs> Amanda, if you want to queue up Francesca's um, video, and then I think 
just to be fair, we better play Gus's too, because. <laughs> yeah, play Gus's. <laughs> Thanks. Harv beat me to it. Thanks, Harv. Wait a minute, we're not hearing. Harv? If you're muted, Harv, we can't hear Francesca. <laughs> Francesca, where'd you come from? Where'd you grow up? I was born and raised in South Florida and got my um, master or my bachelor's degree at uh, Florida State University. FSU? Mm-hmm. Donalds. That's a that's a good that's a good school. That's a good school. So what got your interest in weather and meteorology? Was it done hurricanes or something like that off coming up? I wanna say it was hurricanes, but I don't know. I just I always remember standing out when it was about to start raining and trying to figure out when it was gonna start raining and my mom yelling at me that it was lightning and I needed to come inside. So <laughs> And of course, it, you need to come inside, but yeah. <laughs> it, it's true. Meteorologist, it's, it's deep. It runs back to your childhood. I used to run outside in my bare feet, my underwear, to measure the snow on Long Island during a big snowstorm because I was so excited it was snowing. I can't agree on that one, but. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. My name is Francesca Lappin, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Oklahoma, working with the Center for Autonomous Sensing and Sampling. How the surface interacts with the air directly above it is dynamic and widely represented. This is called the atmospheric boundary layer. Recent developments in UAS designed to observe the atmosphere can fill this data gap. Given high resolution data measurements from the boundary layer, we gain insights into atmospheric processes. Currently, I am investigating how buoyancy functions in time and space within the boundary layer. Positively buoyant parcels drive convective mixing, which destabilizes the atmosphere and can lead to severe weather. Conversely, negatively buoyant parcels and a stable boundary layer can be conducive for low-level jets. Buoyancy may also be able to predict flying conditions for UAS and small planes. There are numerous other potentials for uh, buoyancy, and this technique is just one facet of weather sensing UAS. Thank you. So Francesca, why don't you tell them about what's going to happen when they have fixed wing light aircraft and they're flying about 100 feet or 200 feet vertical separation and they hit a thermal? So that'll be messy. Um, but yeah, simple thermals are so sensitive even to just what is your ground layer. So really every strand that we pull at and meteorology opens up a whole new nest of things that we need to further understand. So I'm interested in seeing how buoyancy uh, predates certain events like severe weather events or low level jets, things that can implicate um, aviation or just your average day person trying to go outside for the day. So, you know, um, Dip Line was having a lot of fun in Rwanda with, um, downdrafts that came out of uh, showers and then they would roll along the hills and cause these rotors. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't even think, you know, when they contacted me, I told them that's a tough thing to forecast. I'm not going to tell you I have a magic potion for that. But these are the things that in, in, in the UAS industry that are going to be impactful when people finally have to fly, schedule flights, they occur regularly. These are invisible threats. These are invisible threats that you can't see. You don't know are out there. We don't even always know they're out there. And this is going to, you know, these are going to be impactful to, to operations. And this is why, you know, the work you're doing is so important because what I've also learned is that, you know, we have these light gliders now that they're actually using thermals to stay up. Uh, I know some of you guys may, I might be getting into areas that maybe I shouldn't be, but I don't know your, your IP, but part of what I want to do is figure out how to help these folks keep their glide, keep their drones up longer use less battery power, find those thermals, but also recognize when those thermals are out there that there's a higher incidence of, you need to have more airspace separation. And right now our system's not built for that. We don't think about airspace separation 
because of thermal, it's because big aircraft can handle it. It's just bumpy, you get sick, you know, whatever. Uh, but um, the concern I have is that we're not even talking about thermals. You know, we, everything's based on ceiling and visibility for airspace separation. So I've been working in the ASTM F-38 group for weather and working with others to say, we need to consider this, right? I mean, um, because you are going to have some violent updrafts sometimes that are going to surprise these drones and they're not going to be able to maintain their, you know, their, their flight path and they're going to, you know, go rogue without them going rogue on purpose. So these are the things that, you know, True Weather's doing. So yeah, I like what you're doing, Francesca. You, you, and do you get to work with drones much? Has, has Phil helped you, uh, you know, um, get, get you involved a little bit into the drone dynamics of, what, of how this stuff could affect drones? Uh, yeah, I mean, most of the data, almost all of the data that I've been using has been from our copter sons in different field campaigns. Uh, we are going to be flying in uh, at our local airport to see how we can kind of translate that into more aviation geared uh, analysis. And I don't personally know if we've ever noticed the copter on bobbling going on a. Well, that's a, that's a rotary though, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, fixed wing is what I'm talking about. Fixed wing. Okay. Yeah, the fixed wing are the ones that are going to have trouble. <laughs> Show and tell, Dan. That's tight. You can handle that. You need that result of home working. The fixed wing have to go longer distances, right? They're going to be doing BB loss. They're going to be carrying stuff. And and um, the lighter ones, you know, this is going to be an issue. Well, I want to give a shout out to Francesca because this is a nice application for the data, as you mentioned, John, that – We've been collecting these profiles, and you know the, the copper song performs very admirably. And and she had just come on to the program, and she said, "Had you thought about looking at buoyancy from these data profiles?" I thought, "No, actually, I mean, I mean in retrospect, it seemed like an obvious product to calculate." And she started working with that, and start looking for precursors to convection initiation during the big field campaign. And, and like you mentioned, she's going to be working on this um, NASA ULI project that Jamie and I are involved with. And we may be making the very first weather measurements with the UAS at a U.S. airport um, ever. So it'll be exciting to do that. We've already got the flight permissions and Francesca's all ready to go with um, evaluating the data. So well, she, she has been doing a really good job on this project. Yeah, um, you know, I'm looking, you know, I hired, uh, what I am looking to hire are people who are uh, masters and PhDs who have worked in the UAS industry as, as meteorologists. Um, North Dakota, I just hired somebody up in the University of North Dakota. They have a very robust UAS center up there. You know, as you guys know, you're all in comp a little competition, but uh, North Dakota has their test range up there. And, um, and I've been, I like that, that school because they do a lot of, a lot of the meteorology programs are around what's going on at the test range, right? So for me, that's the applications I'm looking for. I, you know, I need people who understand the pain points of UAS so that we can really tackle these, these challenges so that we can do better in the future. And, and um, thermals are going to be one component of this, uh, and uh, in, this, in this process, it's on, it's on my, you know, I already have a thermal capability to provide that to some uh, customers out there who are flying the uh, solar uh, 60,000 footers trying to get up, you know, with those long, big, long wingspans. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they can't take more than five knots of crosswind and, you know, they've got to have a good day to help them get up. So these are the types of things that we're working on at True Weather where, we're trying to operationalize the things Francesca is doing so that we can bring it rapidly out through our platform, through our SaaS platform and make that available to end users in a way that they would never be able to have access to, to that because it would, you know, because things take time if you go through, you know, the government, right? I know that I did it for 28 years. That's why I left. I, I couldn't handle it anymore. I was pulling my hair out. Uh, so, um, yeah, so this is really cool, Francesca. Now I'm going to remember you. You got to send me a LinkedIn, all right? And if you, our job here is done. The thing is, oh, you got to understand, Francesca. We're done. If you 
come <laughs> to us, you're not going to South Florida. You're going to be <laughs> for Syracuse. <laughs> I mean, it's Eastern time zone. That's good enough. Eastern time. Lake effect hey. snow and cold as hell. One or the other. Pick one. Don't hey, know Amanda, would you play Gus's video real quick for us? I'm originally a northerner, so one of my first weather things that I remember very vividly as a small child was the blizzard of 93. Yep. Star um, of the century. Yep. It was, it was wild. I was very Alabama. young still. Um... <laughs> So, I and I, I, my name is Gustavo Zavid. I'm a PhD at the University of Oklahoma and the creator of the Lower Atmosphere Carbon Dioxide Acquisition System. LACAS is composed of a thermodynamic sensor scoop, a flight controller, and a CO2 mini chamber. The thermodynamic scoop provides a characterization of the sample atmosphere and the reference for post processing corrections in CO2. The CO2 mini chamber provides a controlled environment for two K3FR sensors, and the autopilot integration was developed as a native autopilot library for PEXOC. This provides measurements which are accurately time and position stamped by the aircraft's GPS and transmitted to the scientists on the ground in real time through the aircraft's flight telemetry. This design makes LACA's platform agnostic, allowing the system to be deployed in fixed and rotary wing aircraft without any change. LACA's is an open source project available to the scientific community. Cool. That's great. Thank you. That was really good, Gus. Everybody did so great. I, um, I want to just open it up for anybody who has any last questions. I, um, I, I always think that when there's an opportunity for really bright young minds to come together with people who have figured some things out, that there's going to be a lot of value. So um, certainly I appreciate everybody taking time to, to share and just be open and let it just be a dialogue. But I, I don't know, does anybody else have anything they want to share or questions or Now's the time. <laughs> Don, it's Cliff. Most, many people aren't old enough to remember this, but uh, since we're talking weather, I grew up south of Buffalo, blizzard of 77, 25 foot high snow drifts. You would have loved it. I know. I know. We only had in, seven, in that blizzard in 77 on Long Island, we only had, uh, uh, well, no, 78. We had 26 inches. Yeah. No, you can't match Buffalo. You cannot. So you're a Bills fan, that means, right? Yes, sir, I am, yes. So we're playing you this weekend, the Jets. You got to <laughs> get but, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> I, uh, I went did my undergraduate in, in Erie, Pennsylvania, so I also, too, know Lake Effect pain. I am sorry. <laughs> no, that's, um, that's a really tough thing to forecast, and that's what we're working it's on. It's awful. Too. We're trying to get the bands down because at the New, New York State test range, you know, they – we trying to figure out how to improve our forecasting so you can end up flying in before those bands start moving. So, um, yeah, that'll be a Francesca. If, if anything ever happened and somehow, you know, true weather got, you know, more revenue and we can hire you, um, the, uh, you could use convective instability, uh, skill set for lake effect snow bands. Yeah. <laughs> we were supposed to this summer, uh, go out and study dry lines and, the horizontal convective rolls is it the same thing <laughs> oh <laughs> why not, those <laughs> not, this is really this is fun stuff you, you'll see the thunderstorms the showers are only eight eight to ten thousand feet tall but they drop you know two inches an hour so uh or whatever so uh, now this is this is gonna be totally different than what you're used to but it's all about the cape and the convective instability that lake is like you know 50 degrees and the A50 temperatures minus 30. And uh, it's like, you know, you just get a little bit of uplift and a little cyclonic curvature and it just, it's Katie bar the door, right? In Oklahoma, you would get a little, yeah, you know, a little drizzle probably for something like that, you know. But. There's a, um, a student who graduated with his master's now working for NOAA, Daniel, who did UAS research with us to do uh, precip type predictions using uh, 
vertical profiles from our copters, and he's very interested in snow, sleet, other nonsense. And we went out and profiled in sleet. It was it was sleeting, right, Tony? I think you were out. It was gross that day. Which yes. Time did you say? Somebody walked on Lake Skinny Atlas. Alan, that was you, huh? <laughs> Alan, there he is. So isn't that a beautiful town? That's where, you know, I mean, that's where Francesca could set up her homestead, right? <laughs> Lake Skinny Atlas, wouldn't you say, Alan? That was one of the best experiences I had. I was uh, up training the uh, Air National Guard at Syracuse uh, there at Hancock Field yep. in the winter. And uh, it what a great organization and what a great city. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they got UAVs up there. And one of my guys that works for me, he's a guard. He works out there as a guardman. He just left. He separated the Air Force for 12 years, and now he's there. Um, yeah. 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 So There's a lot of connections, uh, General Atomics to Syracuse, to North Dakota. We've got our flight test and training center there um, in the Grand Forks. Uh, we've got a partnership with Kansas State University Polytechnic. Cliff has probably talked about some of the research and uh, the radar algorithms that uh, the uh, University of Oklahoma has helped us with. Yeah. Um, we're, we're kind of, uh, we're fortunate we get to work in this space. If you ever need though, that, that good weather stuff for general atomics, when you're flying out there in Grand Forks and you're getting frustrated because they're telling you the weather's better than it is. Let me know. We're there. No, no. Yeah. You weather guys, you kept me alive many times. <laughs> no kidding, man. Even, uh, even in evacuating the U S embassy in Monrovia, Liberia. Ah, you, so I got it. Yeah. Don't, don't fly now. Wait an hour and you'll have a break between the monsoon rains and you can make the trip. Yeah, that's, that's sweet when that happens. You know, yeah. you, you, you all realize that you're all not speaking German because we made the D-Day forecast, the weather forecast that, that was the Normandy invasion and that there was only like one day in like two months that they could have went. And Eisenhower looked at the weather guy two days out, and the weather guy said, you can go. This is the time. And you got to remember, there was no models back then. There was no satellite imagery. You know, you had a bunch of guys sitting in eastern Canada going, oh, there's a break in the weather here. Let's see how long it's going to take to get over, you know, to, uh, to uh, England. But, um, yeah, once in a while we deliver, you know. 50% <laughs> of the time, right? That's it. But that was a good one, right? That was a good 50%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You gotta have thick skin, Francesca. You gotta have thick skin. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> Ever since I was little, been working on it. That's, that's right. You're training. You're in training. Anything well. else for the good of the cause? I thank you all. This has been uh, this delightful. This was enjoyable. I hope Very people fun. got as much fun out of it as. I did. I thought it was engaging. Hey, Sally. Hey, Craig. Hey, Craig. How are you? So, I've, I've just been listening, but just for the crew, um, I'm not necessarily in business. I work for the Chamber of Commerce in Junction City. Uh, I've met with uh, Woody and Cliff before, but uh, the reason I'm on here is, so I think we have a great location for businesses if they want to expand or move to. Uh, we are right outside Fort Riley. We're right off of I-70. Uh, we're 20 minutes from K-State. Now we're from K-State Poly. Uh, we have the Gray Eagles that fly here at Fort Riley. We have a workforce that's intelligent, has security clearances, and uh, plenty of space to build. So if anybody knows anybody that's looking to expand or, or grow their business uh, or get close to uh, a good UAS area, uh, we have a lot to offer. So feel free to reach out to me. So thanks for your time real quick. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Craig. Thanks, Don. You too. Is there anybody else that's been kind of in the background that wants to say anything? I see there's some non-video participants, but if you want to remain anonymous, that's okay. That's totally fine, too. <laughs> it's the end of the day. It's been a long day, so... Thank you all a lot. I hope, you know, as you start thinking about not only the kind of research you want to do, 
but you heard from three really different companies, I'm sure, and kind of maybe in terms of culture and context and what the work might feel like and what the energy um, might feel like. You know, I've been in startups, I've been in larger organizations. I worked for the federal government for like this long and I decided that nobody was gonna survive me working for the federal government, you know, and so that, I mean, it's equally important to find that right fit, that culture fit, that context fit, and the people who get you. You know, I mean, I, I've always, I, I love to build organizations and raise money, but I also have really appreciated working for organizations that have money. You know, so when General Atomic says they've got some development money, money for development, r and I'm like, well, that's pretty nice. Um, or you could be on the other side where you're out there raising it and making it happen. And um, so I guess I would, if I had one parting piece of advice, it would be to, weigh that equally um, with everything else you're weighing. You know, you all have a lot to bring to companies and um, certainly your talents are needed and um, think about fit and, uh, and uh, I wish you all well. And I'm so, I, I watched all the student videos, all the student research videos and um, I, you know, I'm like, wow, so, so much smarter than I was at their age. <laughs> Congratulations, you all, for uh, being in a really interesting industry. And I wish you all a good night. And we'll see you tomorrow at the Tech Forum. <laughs> Thanks, Sally. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. See you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night.